Have you ever wondered what it would be like if you combined the FromSoft patented Dodge Roll Parry combat loop with Disney-esque fairy tales and children's nursery rhymes? Well, you'd probably just get better Disney. Anyways, nah, you get this. Look at all this. The fast-paced, stamina-centered gameplay, the weird, almost eldritch enemy design, but not really, because everything's just made out of wood, because everything's a puppet. The darkly elegant European artistic themes. I mean, look at this backdrop. Is that a fucking bridge? How many of those have we seen in Souls games? I mean, come on. The characterization of Pinocchio has been told through so many different writers and taken down so many different avenues that it's hard to pin down what things were original and what nuances were added by someone as time went on. But the three main focal points usually remain the the same. Pinocchio is a sentient puppet made by a man named Geppetto, his nose grows when he lies, and he's an expert swordsman that can cut down crowds of literally bleeding puppets in a, in a single swipe. As the demo begins to kick off, you have three different weapon options you can choose from, and you select one by committing to a path of balance, dexterity, or strength. We've all played Souls games for like 14 years at this point, I'm, I'm just gonna assume you know what's up with each of these, they're fairly straightforward. And it's not really too hard of a commit either, because all the weapons you end up getting like 30 minutes later from a street vendor anyways. This menu is mostly just to decide your base stats. Right, so let's go over all the vocabulary swaps. You got your standard R1 to slash, R2 to slash harder setup with a dodge and a sprint. Flasks are called pulse cells now. Souls are called ergo. Instead of the dark side or homeward bone, now you got the last resort. Bonfires are now stargazers. Strength and decks have been swapped out for slightly cooler, more befitting words like motivity and technique, which I'm honestly surprised is even a real word, but apparently it is. I'm a stickler for how cool things are named in the game's universe, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, these guys chose some pretty sick names, so kudos to that. You have six different attributes to upgrade, and they each highlight whatever is going to be affected before committing to that specific level, which is a really nice touch. Vitality determines your health, vigor determines your stamina, capacity determines your legion and equip load, motivity and technique we've kinda already touched on, and advance heightens the power of really unique weapons like the electric coil and serves a similar purpose as the arcane stat in Bloodborne. Just by the way, we're gonna be making like a fuck ton of comparisons to Bloodborne, because this game wears its inspiration so conspicuously that it's one feather cap away from a full Maria cosplay. And I don't think there's a single goddamn problem with that. Well, I think there are a couple small- just, just a couple small things. It might just be my Bloodborne tinted glasses getting in the way of giving the demo some fair criticism, but even though it's always been my style, I can definitely see the potential arguments for how the art direction edges Bloodborne a little too much at times, even if the architecture is technically Eastern European or whatever the fuck art history nerds in the comments want to call it. Instead of armor, you can change your outfit in the equipment menu. From what I found, there aren't too many outfits to choose from in the demo, but it seems to indicate that the game will have quite a bit of them, as I was given a new one after each boss encounter. You can even pick up accessories along the way, which serve an equally null effect to anything like armor rating or passive defense, but I guess now you can ravage the whole of inner crot with a donkey head. You can even customize the hilts of your blade at any stargazer, which in turn changes the weapon's attack, moveset, and scaling. If you're dissatisfied with the greatsword only scaling with strength, then you can just detach the default hilt and swap it with the wintry rapier, and now you have a thrusting, dexterity scaling greatsword. It, it's, it's pretty insane. Regrettably, I think developing a Souls-like game has been a trend for a few years now, and unfortunately, the more popular something gets, the more watered down it's likely to become. I actually feel very little of that with Lies of P. It, it is there, don't get me wrong, but but I don't feel that much of it. When you're shooting for a game that feels like a Souls game, it's very hard not to end up with something that doesn't feel derivative. Yes, the gameplay, the art direction, even the writing and voice acting at times all feel very familiar in plenty of different aspects, but familiar and derivative I think are very different. The key difference being the demo didn't make me want to go back and play a FromSoft game, it made me want to continue through the rest of this one and see what else it was capable of. Once you enter the hotel, you figure out very quickly that it's essentially meant to be a Firelink Shrine equivalent. Here you can upgrade weapons, buy tools, level up your character, and a whole bunch of other things you can't do anywhere else except the hotel. The calming soundscape that starts playing as soon as you enter really drives home the point that this is going to be your hub area for a large chunk of the game. And when that same soundscape gently fades out once you step outside and draw your weapon, it's hard not to make a comparison to the Firelink Shrine. But the soundtrack doesn't sound like an unused FromSoft composition. It sounds like, well, it sounds like Lies of Peeve. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's fun, it's weird, it's it's just a good little sound overlay. Kind of a shame the rest of the soundtrack doesn't really evoke the same sentiments, as I'm referring specifically to the soundscape that plays during your time in Krat Hotel. Most other music scores only make themselves present when a boss arrives, because the game seems to take the whole silence speaks volumes approach when just exploring the town. 
you only get three cells, which, you know, pretty par for the course, but there is a really helpful feature to these cells that I really like, which is that staying aggressive in combat will recharge a single cell, but only if you don't have any left. If you still have one in the tank, it won't matter how many slap fights you get into, you're still going to have one by the end. I actually really like this feature because it prioritizes an aggressive playstyle, but only when it counts. Patience and observation are both still required because that's just how any Souls combat loop is going to work, but it isn't until you're literally on the knife edge where that aggressive play really starts to matter in a way that makes spamming throwable items at everything when you're almost dead a less preferable option. This is especially helpful in boss fights because even if your weapon is less powerful or just not upgraded right or if your build isn't too comfortable, you still have a degree of sustainability that allows you to stand a chance against bosses you would otherwise not be equipped to fight. The only time in recent memory FromSoft has toyed around with replenishable Estus would be clearing out groups and dungeons or whatever, like an Elden Ring. But this always seemed inconsistent because if even one enemy in a particular group got curious and decided to check out the edge of a cliff for some reason, you'd convince yourself the whole crowd was wiped out and just not get the refill. Whereas a system like this prioritizes how much of a participant you are in the game's combat instead of just scaling it off of your kill count. The visuals are a really nice touch, and the level design really does feel alive at times. There is a pretty wide variation of claustrophobic corridors and open city streets that make each battle with enemies feel like there's a lot more going on than just dodging and hitting. I was starting to convince myself the whole first half of the game was just going to take place on a main street, and all the crashed wagons and manhole assets were just going to be par for the course, and I was just going to be forced to make friends with them. But then when I started crossing a bridge to what was very obviously a boss, the scope of the town really began to open up. You could see the towering skyscrapers in the distance that the game was being very deliberate in painting up to be the next big location. The hang man with the purge puppet sign is a nice little detail that actually tells you more about the world you're exploring, instead of just throwing you down the back alley of a European slum and expecting you to spend the next couple hours turning everyone into stringy meat paste. And that's doubly appreciable when this is the first game in years I've ever seen on PC that didn't devolve into a middle school slideshow the second I saw more than two textures at once. Because lately, PC launches have pretty much guaranteed laughably bad performance on launch, and at least a couple weeks after to boot. I'm not saying we should start giving out brownie points for games that manage to avoid issues that shouldn't be present on launch to begin with. I'm just glad that I'm actually playing a demo that feels well put together, and at least least kind of optimized to a decent extent. I'm playing on high settings with a basic 3070, not even the TI variant, and the frame drops I experienced were minimal at the worst of times, so A-OK -okay in my book. Some small gripes with the combat, nothing too deal-breaking, especially considering this is all a demo and therefore subject to change, but the one thing I continued having problems with was the game's take on the rally system. If you take damage while in a guarding stance, you have an opportunity to slap fight the enemy for a bit and potentially regain some of your lost health. This is nothing new. And that by itself feels okay, but the reason it worked so well in Bloodborne was because combat was fast and responsive, which is a huge reason why the rally system has never been as compatible with most other FromSoft games that include it. Taking damage head-on instead of guarding takes away your opportunity to rally altogether, which does encourage the use of blocking in its own way, but I'm not sure if this is a good way to do so. Even Elden Ring has this system with Melania's Great Rune, and it has a few niche uses, but for the most part, it doesn't feel nearly as at home as it would in a game with a faster combat loop, and I'm still not completely sure if that's what Lies of P is even aiming for. The guard Guard comes up pretty much immediately, no matter the weapon's weight, but dodging always seems to take a bit of time, and with nowhere near the necessary iframes to consistently be evading through attacks, at least not in the same way you would traditionally. I'm pretty sure dodging gives you like three iframes, it almost feels like pathetically weak at points. This led me to believe perfect guarding was just the preferred option the game was trying to encourage, which actually did prove very beneficial on the first boss, the Parade Master, but against some other enemies that are just flat out faster than you are, or against enemies that have combos, guarding doesn't work nearly as well, and almost always leads to you losing that rally HP in a pinch. Everything just feels like 20% slower than it should. I feel like the walking and sprinting should be a little faster, the dodging should cover just a little more distance. I, I get that he's supposed to be a puppet, but that doesn't mean the whole combat loop has to feel stiff and ungiving. I've heard tell of a potential upgrading system that revolves specifically around evasion that we didn't really get a chance to see in the demo. 
I don't know how true this is, I just heard it from somewhere. And the dodge being so unreliable is just a symptom of us being at the very beginning of the game. Which, I guess, could explain a few things. It could explain the lack of distance dodging seems to cover, or the amount of iframes received per dodge. But I don't think that's going to help that much in the long term either. The enemy's limbs have their own collision, which isn't the case in a lot of FromSoft games. It's a small detail, but this, in my opinion, makes dodging feel that much more discomforting, and further reinforces the idea that the game is trying its best to push you in the direction of perfect guarding as a consistent defense. That's not a drawback in itself, I'm perfectly okay with a sprinkle of Sekiro on my Bloodborne pasta for that extra flavor, but from what I can tell, the three boss fights the demo throws at you really tries to drive home the importance of perfect guarding, or even regular guarding for that matter, as taking damage head-on doesn't give you an opportunity to rally some of that HP back. So even if hypothetically fully upgraded, the question still remains, what incentive would I have to dodge that would outweigh even standard guarding? Because right now I feel like it's just getting me killed. Also, I'm... I'm sorry. I'm not gonna make a super big deal out of this, but I feel like I should at least mention it because I have a slight worry that this little problem is going to define how future side quests and NPC interactions are handled later in the game. Why is the Red Ribbon side quest from Bloodborne in this demo? Like, it's literally the exact same fucking quest. The woman in the window talking about her daughter or younger sister or whatever, I don't remember, that before the quest even continues, we all know is DTF. Deader than fuck. <laughs> I'm willing to give the game points for at least trying to make it a little different. The voice acting is still pretty solid, but this does scare me just a little bit because this is the demo. This is supposed to set the pace we should expect for the rest of the game. So how many other side quests hiding in the game that are a little too similar to their Bloodborne counterparts am I going to run into when I actually buy the game? Am I going to find a shirtless man disguising himself as a lowly peasant villager or something, but he morphs into a human puppet hybrid when I start attacking him? And if it sounds like I'm tearing the gameplay apart for no reason, then, well, one, there is a reason, that's the point of the video, and two, I promise I'm genuinely not, I just really want this game to be as good as it can be, because everyone knows how much time I spent playing Bloodborne for the past eight years, and I feel like Lies of P has a lot of potential to set itself up as a spiritual successor of sorts, because, listen, guys, it, it's time to face reality. Bloodborne 2 is never coming, Bloodborne PC is never coming, our only shot at revisiting Yarnum in the future is a Bloodborne remake, and honestly, Honestly, that's not a conversation anyone should be concerned about having for at least five more years. I am stoked out of my fucking mind that I get to see the life essence of Bloodborne fueling the passion of a video game like this eight years later. I just want it to be a great game that I personally can still replay years after it comes out, and right now I think it's extremely close to that.